Uh oh. Oh, there it goes. We're live. I was worried for a minute there. The the uh, little clock was circling and uh, we weren't going live, but it tells me that we're live. So welcome to Fly Tying Monday on Tuesday. Um, I hope uh, hope this didn't screw up your weekly schedule, but yesterday was MLK Day. It's an Orvis holiday. It's a national holiday, and I hope uh, hope everyone had a had a great MLK holiday, and that you celebrated it in in an appropriate way, honoring the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So here we are on Tuesday, and we're going to be tying a beetle today. Fairly simple beetle. And I'll start to talk about beetles uh, in a minute. I want to wait till we make sure we uh, we have um, have some people here. It looks like uh, I see somebody called Scientific Anglers. Okay, who at Scient who at SA is uh, is watching this silly show today? I don't think it's Scientific Angler. It must be. Who is it? Give us a name there. Um, the pattern description is up there, and I have a confession to make. I'm not tying this on a 2x long dry. I was I was uh, practicing this fly and looking at hooks the other day and decided that, you know what, I really want to tie this on a, the Orvis uh, tactical dry fly because it's a wide gap, short shank hook, uh, it's barbless already. I don't have to worry about pinching the barb. And it works really well for this pattern. So you can tie it on a 2X dry. You can tie it on any dry fly you want, or you could even tie it on a on an imp hook if you want, because it's got enough foam to float it. But um, anyway, I'm switching hooks on you, so sorry about that. But uh, the, the tying, tying will be the same. Um, and... Beetle flies. So let's talk. Let's talk for a minute about beetles. One of the, I think, one of the most important uh, patterns you can have in a in a trout angler's box is a beetle pattern. Uh, it's one of those flies that that really can turn the trick when nothing else works. Um, I have had countless times where I've had rising fish. Yeah, that I that I for whatever reason couldn't catch, and I'd slap a beetle down in the middle of them. They definitely weren't eating beetles, and um, and a fish would just slam the beetle. It's more of a almost more of a reaction strike, like a fish would take a streamer. But it doesn't work all the time. But it, but it works often enough. Um, fish are always on the lookout for terrestrials falling in the water, and I think when that beetle the beetle hits the water with a little bit more of a splat than a standard dry fly. It attracts their attention, and uh, the fish see something that looks like a beetle, ant, wasp, whatever. I mean, they see a lot of terrestrial insects on the water, and boom, they eat it. So um, it's a it's a really good fly to have. It's a great fly for prospecting when you don't see any hatches, but you think the fish might be interested in surface food. Um, they're just, they seem to be always willing to take a beetle. And another one of the, the misnomers about uh, fishing beetles or ants or hoppers or whatever, terrestrial, is that you need to fish them close to the bank. And this fly is called the bank beetle. <laughs> so um, yeah, you could fish it along the banks because beetles fall in from uh, vegetation along the bank. But the thing is that um, anything that drops in the water even if it drops it along the bank, is going to be very quickly pulled into the center of the river, just the way the hydraulics work in a river. The, the current's faster in the center of the river than, than the banks. And a beetle or an ant or whatever that falls in uh, will be quickly drawn out into the center of the river. So fish, fish see these things um, not only along the banks. They see them all over the water. And also uh, beetles fly. They don't all fly very well. Some of them are pretty clumsy. Uh, but they do fly and they splat down in the water that, uh, you know, they, they fall in or they hit the water for whatever reason. So um, don't just restrict your, your beetle fishing to along the banks, even though we're going to tie a fly called the bank beetle. Um, 
I first saw this fly, and I don't know who originated it. It's a fairly basic, fairly basic, almost generic beetle. Um, I used to tie my beetle imitations uh, with, that were fairly complicated. They had uh, parachute posts and parachute hackle and stuff like that. And I was fishing with the, the late uh, Bill Tapley, who uh, was a great angler and a great guy. A uh, good friend of, of Phil Monahan, who is, is in the background today. Um, and uh, we were fishing uh, in my backyard, and Bill pulled out. I told him that beetles work pretty well, and Bill pulled out this imitation. I looked at it, and I said, huh, God, that looks a lot better than the beetles that I'm fishing, and it's a lot simpler to tie, and it's going to float better. So since that day of, of seeing that pattern, uh, I tie nearly all of my beetles uh, like this. And um, I see, is there a season for beetles? Well, Pro Skipper One, um, beetles are pretty active as soon as the air temperature hits somewhere around 50 degrees. So we think of it as a summer fly, uh, but there's lots of beetles around uh, in the early spring. There's beetles around in the fall. And as long as fish are willing to look at the surface, I don't think there's a there's a, a a real beetle season. Although during the summer there aren't as many aquatic insects, so fish are more likely to be seeing terrestrial insects. And you know maybe in the summertime it's better, but they'll work. They'll work in April. They'll work in May, and they'll work in October. Um, Andrew. We don't know what Flagler and I are tying next month, and we had to push that out because of Tim's travel schedule. Uh, is it two? Is it February seventh, Julia? I thought we had I, to push I it out. I just remembered. We haven't confirmed yet. I was about to delete yeah. it. Don't listen to me. <laughs> yeah. So it'll probably be it'll probably be late February because Tim's uh, going to a couple of shows and uh, has some travel time in between. So we don't know what we're going to tie. And we don't know when. <laughs> I told I told uh, I told Flagler I wanted to tie a marabou muddler, and I heard I could hear the screams all the way from New Jersey. So we're not going to tie the marabou muddler. Anyway, uh, so that's the bank beetle. Um, you can tie this in nearly any color you want, and uh, it, typically, if a fish is going to take a beetle, it's not going to be that selective. Uh, to either size or color or anything else, because if you uh, just uh, do a Google search on beetles or coleoptera, which is the order of beetles, you'll see a wide variety of sizes, shapes, colors. Most of them are the same basic shape, but uh, you know some of them are skinnier than others. Some of them are big and wide. Uh, some are black. Some are brown. Some are orange. They're all different colors, and uh, the fish don't rarely see one type of beetle. Uh, so you don't need to worry about an exact imitation unless, unless there's an infestation of a particular beetle that's really common. Maybe, you know, when the Japanese beetles are, get really heavy uh, in the early summer, yeah, you might want to tie an imitation of a Japanese beetle then, but you really don't need to. So you can make them, you can make them any color you want. Um, I tie almost all of mine with um, with an iridescent uh, uh, peacock curl dubbing body. It's uh, here. I'll show it to you. It's ice dubbing uh, peacock color. I think that's a perfect color for the uh, underbody of the beetle. And I tie them all in black, and then I put uh, I put a white foam tab on top of it. Um, and I make the legs black, but you could make the, I make some of the legs brown. You can make them tan. You can make them anything you want. So, um, uh, I'm going to tie it the, the way I tie it, the standard color variation. And I seldom, uh, vary from that, but, um, you, you could, you could use any color. You could use any color dubbing you want, uh, Ken, go to, uh, go to, uh, uh, web search and uh, and look at the beetles or look at the beetles uh, look at the beetles in your area next time you're out uh, out along the stream find some beetles and see, see what color they are um, you know tan black 
green, kind of, a, they're usually kind of an iridescent color underneath. But, um, and, you know, I, w I was supposed to go to Chile this week for 10 days to do some filming. And uh, I'm not going, obviously, because of travel restrictions. But um, there they, uh, somebody recommended to me a, a blue beetle, said you got to have blue beetles when you go to Chile. So who knows? I, I don't know why they like blue beetles there. Maybe there's a blue beetle that's common. Maybe fish there just like blue, but. Um, you could you could make it in blue. You could make it in pink. You make it any color you want. Um, I think it's more of the shape and the splat of the fly that uh, that makes a difference. So anyway, uh, shall we tie? I don't see any other questions. And yes, Ken, we're using. I'm actually not using rubber legs in this. I'm using um, spandex. You all know what spandex is, right? <laughs> um, it's you you'll see it um you'll see it called a uh, life flex hairline sells it as life flex and then you'll see it as um span flex and you'll also see it um as a material called flexi floss and i like the i like the spandex legs instead of silicone or rubber uh, because they're wigglier and I think when, when this thing hits, you, you want it to wiggle. The other thing is um, when you tie like the, the spandex legs on this, you want to find the, the finest diameter, whether you use spandex or, or silicone or rubber, um, you want to use the finest legs you can get because the finer they are, the more wiggle you're going to get on them when it hits the water. And these legs aren't very long on a beetle. And if you put in really short, uh, heavy legs, they're not going to wiggle as much. So just get, uh, sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to look around to find some really, really fine spandex or rubber legs. Um, but you know what, what I would advise you to do with rubber legs, because this is what I do is I'll go to a, a place that has a wide variety, somebody like Fly Fish Food uh, that has a, a great uh, web assortment of uh, fly tying materials. And I'll order, I'll order in, in all in one color, like black or brown, I'll order, you know, one pack each of all the different legs they have. Uh, because it's really tough to tell um, on the internet when you're buying materials on the internet exactly uh, what diameter they are and, and how flexible they are and everything. Um, if you're going to a shop, you could you can see them. But if you're buying uh, over the web, you know these things aren't very expensive. I'd buy one pack, one pack of each type, and check them out, and and see which ones you like the best. Flutter legs, yes, Ed. Flutter legs will work as well. There's lots and lots. Again, go on to go on to like somebody's website, like. Fly fish food, uh, Orvis doesn't have a great variety, but fly fish food does, and you'll see probably at least a half dozen different types of legs. Some of them are similar, some of them are quite different. Okay, shall we tie? Let's tie. Let's start this. Let's start this baby. So that's what it's going to look like in the end. And again, this is a fairly straightforward fly. Fun to tie. So I'm going to take that finished fly out and I'm going to put in, this is a size 12 tactical dry fly hook. So it's got a nice wide gate. It's barbless, very sharp and nice fine wire. And I am going to use a 6-0 thread, 6-0 black thread. You can make this thread any color you want, any color your little heart desires. And I'm just going to start the thread in the middle of the body. And then I'm going to take my flat tying foam, black. And I'm going to bring the sheet over to my hook. And I, I wanted this to be about a hook gap. 
So I'm just going to make a little slit here to mark it. And then usually helps to get a long pair of scissors. And I'm going to grab a longer pair of scissors here. And cut the whole length of the sheet. Now I lost my little, oh, there it is. Cut the whole length of the sheet. And you, you can use a paper cutter or something like that. But I find with a, lo with a pair of long scissors, you can pretty much eyeball it and get it fairly uniform all the way down the length. Using a long piece is going to help you tie this in at the end. And I'll show you why. So just cut a big, and you'll get, you know, you'll get a half dozen flies out of this long piece, but it makes a difference in when you're, when you're finishing it up. And then you're going to uh, center that foam right on top of the hook and grab it. And then just kind of spiral back. Don't worry too much about being neat at this point. And make sure you go all the way to the bend. And then you can secure that foam by crossing back and forth. You may have to do it a bunch of times to get that bound in there just so you don't have a lumpy body. You don't really, you don't have to be too neat at this point. Okay, so there's your, there's your foam tied in and it's centered and it's gonna be pulled over the top. Any questions so far, Julia? No questions? No. No questions so far. Um, I don't know if you had seen when Ed asked about flutter legs, but. Yeah, I did. I said yeah, you could use thought. flutter legs. Okay. Yep. Can that's, use the only, any, that's the only question we've gotten. can use any wiggly thing you want. <laughs> All right. I think the best beetle body material, I, it's called ice dubbing, and it's the peacock, uh, the peacock shade. You can use peacock curl if you want. It doesn't, peacock curl actually, I don't think looks quite as good and it's not as durable as a dubbed body. And peacock curl is getting hard to find. You probably want to save it for other patterns. So I would use, I would use peacock ice dubbing for this fly. And I'm going to take just a small amount, don't need much. And this stuff, oh, that's too much, but that's okay. I'll have some left over for another one. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to take bring this camera over to the fly because I know it's hard sometimes for you to see me dubbing. So I'm gonna bring it over wide. And I'm just gonna take start with just a little bit, and I'm gonna. Didn't quite work. Just going to get it on there. And even though these fibers are long, they uh, they dub pretty well. And then I'm going to you know get a little bit more. And you don't you know somebody's going to say how come you don't use wax? You really don't need wax most of the time if you apply enough pressure and if you use small amounts you don't need wax get that nice and tight on there okay i think that's enough and now i'm just going to wind my body And I'm going to go all the way up 
almost to the hook eye. We're almost right about to there. And then I'm going to come back almost halfway on the shank. I'm going to pull my sheet of rubber straight over the top, press down with my thumb, come over the top, and pull straight down while bracing my um, index finger to the far side and pulling straight down. And that'll secure that body. And you only need about three, four, three or four wraps at this point. Because you're gonna you're gonna be tying lots more wraps on top of that, so that's in there now, pretty good. And then you're gonna take the rubber legs of your choice. Again, I like this uh, Life Flex Span Flex Spandex, and you're gonna take two pieces. And take the whole length and then cut them in half because you don't need you don't need all that. Cut them in half and save the, the other two pieces for your next fly. Now I've got two pieces. And I like to rotate my vise when I do the far side and bring your thread around and secure them in there with about two turns, two nice tight turns. And then you can adjust these legs. They look pretty good. They're sticking out where I want them. And bring your vise back to horizontal and just loop the legs around the front and then secure them on the near side. Take one turn, adjust them if need be, and then pull down to secure them. And I like to cut I like to trim my legs at this point. So I'm gonna trim the far side a little bit shorter and I may trim these again. And I trim the near side shorter just so they don't get in the way. So that's what it looks like at this point. And now, let's make sure that's in focus there. There. That's better. Okay. Now I'm gonna take a, a piece of white foam and uh, you can use you can use yellow if you want or red or pink or whatever. I like I like white because um, white reflects more light than any other color. And sometimes I fish these in the evening and uh, I want I want as much light reflection as I can get off this indicator. I'm just going to cut a little tab, just a little bit narrower than the um, the black piece that I just put in, and I'm just eyeballing that. So I've got a little piece of piece of white foam. And I'm just going to place that on top like so and just come over and just like the top part, I'm gonna pull it straight down up three turns. And then you can trim those a little bit if you want. I trim this one a little bit and then camera's in the way here. Trim this one a little bit. That's just an indicator tab so you can see that thing. Again, you can make it any bright color you want, but I like white. 
And now I'm going to just cut those front legs and trim them. Now you'll notice that this fly has eight legs and insects only have six. So if that bothers you, you can trim one off on each side. It's a, it's a spider beetle. It's a spider beetle. Um, <laughs> um, we do have an interesting question from Craig. He yeah. said, uh, similar to ants, do you find sunken beetle patterns more effective than floating versions at times? What would you use for a sunken pattern? Yeah. Um, I would, uh, I would use, uh, well, if I was going to tie a sunken one, I'd use uh, a piece of uh, duck quill or something over the top so it wouldn't float. And then I'd probably put a little wire underneath the body. Or you could make it put a black bead on for the head. But you can also uh, tie this behind a, uh, tie this behind a, a bead head so that the bead head would sink it. And yeah, they do sometimes, sometimes sunken beetles work pretty well. Sunken hoppers too, sunken ants can be very effective because they do sink, they don't float that well. Okay, now I am going to, I'm just gonna bring my thread forward a little bit and I'm gonna tie in a, a thorax now. If you're tying really small flies, like when I tie 16s or 18s in this pattern, I'd call it done right here. And I'd cut this foam off and I'd whip finish it and that would be it. But a little bit bigger one like this, you can make it a little bit more realistic by forming a thorax. So what I'm gonna do is just come over the top of that foam and pull down again. So that I've got a little thorax in there. This is more for me than for the fish. It does give you, having two points of attachment does give you a little bit um, less rotation of that foam on the hook. Um, but it makes it look a little bit better when you have a, a thorax under there. Um, and then this is the reason you want this foam strip long because it makes it easier to whip finish. So what I'm going to do is I can pull this back much more easily than if I had trimmed it beforehand. So I'm going to just sneak my whip finisher in under there and take a four turn whip finish, press that whip finisher, the top part of the whip finisher up against the foam. That'll keep it from slipping off the hook. And then draw it tight. And you're almost done. Cut your thread. And then just trim, trim the uh, trim this right in front there. Now, technically, beetles have a, a big abdomen, a smaller thorax, and a smaller head. And I think it looks pretty good this way. But if you want to be really realistic about it, then you can cut, you can trim your head so that it's a little smaller than the thorax. And when you, when you tie these on, you have to kind of push the foam back to tie it, tie it on. But, um, you know, it's not a big deal. I see I got a little piece of foam there I'm going to get rid of. So I'll show you what it looks like from the top. I'll focus it. And then from the bottom. So that's it. That's the, the bank beetle. And, you know, like I said, if you want to trim one of those legs on each side, so it only has six legs. But as the uh, great Harry Darby said, if the fish could count, we'd all be in trouble. So. I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about the fact that it has eight legs.
gives it a little bit more wiggle there when it hits the water. And that's the bank beetle. All right, questions. Could you put a dab of super glue on top? Oh, good point. Um, I don't think if this is tied properly, you don't need super glue on the ice tub, uh, but you could if you wanted to, Ed. But um, when you do uh, head cement this, I should put some head cement on here. Let's go back to the tying vise. Um, I'm going to grab my head cement here. Don't use super glue on this because it, it'll turn things white and it won't look very good. Use, um, use regular real head cement. And to head cement this, You want to carefully hit that, those thread wraps and maybe get them on top too. And then probably a little drop here where the legs are attached. And this is more to, this fly isn't going to rotate tied like this. It's not going to twist. And then it's probably a good idea to push your needle down through that foam tab to get a little head cement in there. I wouldn't use UV resin because you may not be able to you may not be able to cure it when you when you stick that uh, when you, when you stick that uh, dubbing needle with head cement down inside the foam. Okay. No, I wouldn't use UV resin. Can you know? I I don't. I just I just you can if you want, but I would worry that you're not going to get it cured. Uh, where it's where it's hidden um, inside the inside the body. Uh, let's see what other questions do we have? Yes, Ed Sally Hansons. You can use Sally Hansons. That stinky stuff. I don't like Sally Hansons because it smells. Um, not that it's going to matter on a dry fly. But you can use Sally Hansen's. I also uh, I use I also dub the thread before wrapping the center of the body. It prevents the thread from cutting into the foam. That's interesting, Earl, because I I never have thread cut into foam ever. Um, I know I know some people have problems with it, but um, I think it's the type of foam you're using. If you're buying your foam from a craft store. Um, you, may, you may not be getting the same, same type of foam. I use this Orvis foam, uh, and uh, it's, a very, it's a very dense closed cell foam, and uh, the thread never, ever cuts it, even on, even on small patterns. Bill says, Bill says his looks nice. Good, Bill. Congratulations. Who else tied along with me today? Would you consider, oh, would you consider hitting the black foam with a touch of nail polish to create a shell effect? Um, I don't think it matters that much on the top of the fly because the fish don't see the top that much. But if you notice, this Orvis foam has kind of a glossy finish to it anyway. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to put any foam on it. You could if you want to. You, you want to make it look cool, but um, I, I don't think uh, I don't think you need it. Any other questions? 
Doesn't look like it, huh, Julia? No, I don't see anyone. That's a. I like that. I like that fly. So who wins today, me or Flagler? <laughs> uh, loco foam is a nice alternative. Okay. You can try loco foam. Just be careful. Just be careful of the, you know, of the foam you get. I think you're much better off buying your foam from uh, a fly shop or from somebody who wholesales fly tying materials because the foam you get in craft stores uh, may not be as durable. The next tie off with Tim, we don't know yet, FT Conroy. Uh, we, uh, Tim has a travel schedule that's a little tight in February, so we're not, we're not quite sure. <laughs> Flagler would have it covered in glue, so you win. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> uh. If you make a triangle at the beginning of the sponge, it will be easier to tie it at the beginning. That's true. That's true, Peter. Um, you, you can. Uh, you, do, you don't really need to. It's, it's easy enough to catch that foam, but you can make a little triangle, and sometimes it makes it easier to grab the foam, and I think especially on smaller flies. Um, yes, largemouth and, and bluegill will eat this fly. Certainly, certainly bluegill will eat this fly and large mouth, you know, and a little bit bigger size. Uh, I'm sure they would. Yeah. Can you and Tim tie a saltwater fly in your tie off? I know you live in Florida and you're dying. Well, we've done a couple of saltwater flies recently. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to discuss that with the master and see what he says. I, I think it's my turn to pick. So maybe I will pick a saltwater fly. Uh, any other questions? No, I don't see anything. Did I miss any questions? Chubby Chernobyl. Uh, I've tied one before. I've tied a Chubby Chernobyl before, and we're actually going to, we're actually going to tie a Chubby Chernobyl in our fly tying 101 classes, which, um, which uh, I think you can see advertised now. They're basic uh, fly tying classes that we're going to run in February. Uh, Johnny, we just uh, just tied a shrimp recently. We tied uh, Enrico Puglisi's spawning shrimp. If you want to see a shrimp pattern, um, go into the either the uh, the playlist on YouTube or in the Orvis archives and. Um, I tied the EP spawning shrimp with, with Enrico uh, helping me along. So um, we've already we've already done a shrimp recently. I don't want to repeat things too often. All right. Doesn't look like any other questions. Lots of suggestions. A CDC shrimp? I don't think so. I'm not gonna tie a shrimp fly for a while, Johnny. Just just tie a shrimp fly. I'm not gonna tie one. I'm not gonna tie one for a while. Andrews Andrews tuning in from Jordan. Wow, that's great. I don't think we've ever had anybody from Jordan on here. Bow River bugger. I don't know. I don't know. Mary ever smartberry patterns. I don't think so. We're we're not we're not here to tie uh, historical patterns. We're mostly here to tie fishing patterns, and I don't think many people uh, fish with those um, those older wet fly patterns. So probably not, Greg. All right, I'm seeing lots of suggestions. I haven't seen anything anything that uh, I like so far. Have you ever tied a very small fly? Yes, we have, Ed. Um, We've tied, uh, I think I tied a size 22 or 24 uh, blueing olive. Um, again, you can look in the archives for that. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll see you. I'll see you next Monday. We're back to Monday. I'm going to tie a um, uh, a red copper John. Uh, rubber leg, red copper john. So uh, copper john is a is a great pattern. It's one of the best nymph patterns there is. 
And um, I like, uh, I tie a little bit simpler, more durable version. Instead of using biots, I use uh, rubber legs for the tails and the legs. So, uh, and it's a red, it's a red one instead of a copper one, which I find to be super, super effective. So we're going to tie a red copper John nymph. Um, and then the following week, we're, we are, Ed, going to tie a saltwater pattern. We're going to tie one of Henry Cowan's bait fish patterns. I forgot which one it is, but Henry's going to join us and tease me. Um, so that'll be fun. So we are, we are going to do a saltwater pattern pretty soon. Not a shrimp fly. <laughs> it's a bait fish pattern. That'll work, in, that'll work on trout and work on freshwater fish as well. All right, everyone. I um, want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. I hope, I hope some of you tied along. Don't forget, if, if you missed something, you came in late, uh, these, are, these are in a playlist on YouTube or they're archived on the Orvis Facebook page. So you can, you can watch it again and again and again <laughs> as many times as you want. Um, they'll be there. They'll be there uh, for a long time. So uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we will see you next Monday.